Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome to Give and Take, where we discuss the latest scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of the gospel so that you go out and share it with others. Joined in the studio by my colleagues Fazrana, AJ Roberts, and today we are going to tackle a difficult question. Does junk DNA mean that we're descended from Neanderthals? Hey, Fuzz and AJ, glad to have you in the studio today. Thanks, Jeff. So, before we get into this, what is junk DNA and why should we care about it? You know, junk DNA is really a phrase that was unfortunately coined to refer to all the bits of the genome that we didn't know what their function was and we didn't think there was a function and it was just remnants of, of common descent through evolutionary processes. So, so this is the genetic code, the DNA that's the backbone of all human or all life in, on Earth. And so there are sections of it that we presume are functional and sections that aren't and the, 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 uh, the unfunctional parts of the junk. That's right. Okay. And, you know, and it's not just simply the presence of junk in the genome that's problematic. It's the fact that there are shared junk DNA sequences that we see between humans and the great apes, which people interpret as being evidence that we must share an evolutionary ancestor. And this problem really is so significant that when I started with Reasons to Believe in 1999, there was absolutely nothing we could say about why there was so much junk DNA in the human genome. It was really the most significant challenge to uh, the idea of design that, that in mm -hmm. that human beings are the product of a creator. So, so it seems like if I got your point there that there's two issues to it. One is that there's junk in the first place. Is like if a creator has created it, why is all this junk? Right. But even more pressing than that in some sense is if this junk matches in primates as opposed to humans or the apes and humans, that points to the idea that we're descended from one another. That's right. And so you're saying for 20 some odd years, we had no good response to this, correct? That's right, yes. So I've heard a lot about this ENCODE project. That's kind of why we're here today. What is the ENCODE project? Well, this is a project that began shortly after the human genome was sequenced. So the human genome is the DNA backbone, correct? That's okay. exactly right. And the, the thought was, well, we need to understand what all this data means. So it's kind of like the Rosetta Stone for the human genome. And ENCODE stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And it was an attempt just to try to identify all the different DNA elements that are found in the genome and what those different elements do or don't do. And uh, this project can, was- Can you give an example? What would be a DNA element? What's something- Well, like a gene would be a, a DNA element. It's a piece of the genome that has a particular function. In this case, it encodes the information to make a protein. Okay, all right, okay. Or, or regulatory elements, promoters, enhancers, things so like that. So regulatory meaning there's- They the... regulate the way the DNA is turned on or turned off. Okay, all right, okay, so ENCODE, uh, they, they were seeking to look at these DNA right, elements. Right, and, and this project began uh, in the early 2000s in a pilot phase, but the phase two results were published in uh, the fall of 2012. Uh, and it, this was a major uh, accomplishment in the ENCODE project. And, and so what did they find? So in 2012, I think that they found that the DNA was about 80% related to functional aspects and not 90% just junk. So, but the so, controversy so, okay, so, arose then over what they meant by functional. Right? Okay, so, so, so I guess to, to make that connection there, if a DNA isn't functioning, it was considered junk, correct? Correct. And so now the ENCODE is saying that roughly 80% of the DNA that they're looking at has some sort of function. Th that's what the phase two results indicated, right. but we're now in the phase three part of the ENCODE project, and the expectation is that the more that we... We learn about the genome, even that remaining 20% is probably going to largely be functional as well. So it, it's changing our view of the genome from this vast wasteland of junk, where you know 95% of the human genome is junk, to what looks to be most of it is functional. So, so if you're, if I could get the history just from what you said here, go back 20, 30 years ago, we've got genes. We figured out what parts of the genome coded for genes. That was a relatively small fraction, few two percent, percent, two percent. <clears throat> um, the rest of it was presumed to be junk. We know there's some sort of regulation. There's other things. And so the ENCODE is showing that not only do you have coding for genes, but you have other things where they're actively there's function to what's going on there. It's not just kind of sitting there along for the ride. That's right. And and I think what's shocking to people is 
how much of the human genome needs to be dedicated to regulating the activities of the genes. Uh, even, even prior to ENCODE, people thought, well, there's going to be some DNA that's not coding proteins that's going to be functional, but it's just a small part that's regulating uh, the, the genome. Mm -hmm. But now it's like the most of the genome is devoted to regulation, and a very small part is to the, the building blocks. This strikes me as a, a bit of advice I got from my dad when working on a car on my cars. You know, I was sitting down there watching him, and we were working on changing the brakes at the time. But you know, as he said, you know, as you take it apart, make sure you keep track of where they came apart, and make sure every piece goes back in the way you got it. Um, if my car was made predominantly of junk. If I lost a few parts or they didn't quite go in, it really wouldn't matter. But if everything had to go back in, that means everything's necessary there. Well, it's in, an interesting analogy because a lot of people would argue that the junk might be important for things like just spacing the regulatory elements or providing sort of an overall structure so that the regulatory and functional bits were in the right place. And so you've got to, first of all, you've got to be really careful about what you mean by functional because it could just be a structural type Filler, activity. Filler, if you will. Okay. Yeah. But, They're spacers. Right. But what we're learning now is that a lot of the DNA is transcribed into what they call non-coding RNAs. And, and that's sort of a, a big black box. Actually, we've adopted the phrase dark matter as well to refer hey, you to... You from the astronomers. Yeah, to refer to all of these sequences that we just really don't know if they're functional and if so, under what conditions and what scenarios. So we've got to be really careful as we try and pick mm -hmm. these things apart experimentally but, to to say functional or non-functional. But one of the things that's really interesting and why this is so important scientifically is because when we do what are called genome-wide association studies where we're trying to identify regions of the genome when they have genetic defects in cause diseases, many times those regions where there are genetic defects are not in the protein coding regions, but they're actually in what we thought was junk in this regulatory region. And so uh, to, to your analogy of... of you know, if most of the automobile was junk, it doesn't really matter if the parts get there or not. What we're discovering is it really does matter if this, this DNA is there because if it's not there or if it's damaged, diseases result. You know, that, that's really a fascinating thing. You know, one, the idea of having this huge genome that's just kind of carried along, it, it kind of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint, as I've said it, that, you know, there's kind of, there's this critical stuff, and as long as that gets replicated, the other stuff can just kind of get carried along, and there's other things that may happen. Uh, but for a, a designer, a designer doesn't put a lot of junk in stuff. There's generally an efficiency, if not an elegance, to the way things are. And so having a bunch of junk in there is not good. The immediate results of the ENCODE seem to be saying that all this stuff we thought was junk isn't junk. That fits much more with a designer type fashion, correct? Yeah. So let, let's kind of deal with that uh, common ancestry bit. You know, if, if we've got the same level of, or the same junk DNA as uh, Neanderthals or the primates uh, or the apes, how, how do we deal with that as Christians? Is that still a problem or not? Well, to me, it, it becomes evidence for common design, not common descent. Uh, what do you well, mean by that? Well, in other words, instead of those shared sequences reflecting an evolutionary history, they could, because they're functional, they could reflect the fact that a creator is using the same design elements in human beings, in the great apes and in the Neanderthals, to accomplish same or similar purposes. So shared similarities can reflect common design, not common descent. So kind of like, a, you know, I do a fair bit of computer programming where I'll take this piece of code because it does something, move it over here, may change the inputs, the outputs, or how often it writes out. But it's, it's it, the design looks the same, but it's not from a common ancestry. It's from I've chosen to do something else with it. That's a, that's a beautiful analogy to exactly what how we would understand those shared sequences from a design framework. You know, what I find fascinating in this discussion of junk DNA is that this was really quite a challenge for a Christian who wanted to argue there was a creator. Why would there be in the, the central component of life, the genome, this huge swaths of just junk? And what we're finding as we continue to do study, particularly through this ENCODE project, is not only is it not junk, it actually appears to have function and be very important, but it also fits very well in this model where a designer is actually using different designs to make sure that things function well. And I think it's just a fascinating, very powerful tool that one of the greatest challenges to the Christian faith or an apologetic for the Christian faith now actually is one of our greatest opportunities. And I would encourage you to go in and read deeper 
go read Fuzz's article, The Human Genome Copied by Design, to be more equipped so you can share this great information with those you know.